Thank you, Ken. I have to confess, I, I, I don't do this on purpose, but it happens when I sing that song, Noel. Every time we sing the word Noel, I, what comes out of my mouth is Goel, G-O-E-L. That's the Hebrew word for Redeemer. And I think of Jesus coming, and He is the Redeemer. If you will, turn to cha uh, Titus chapter 2. I'm going to begin in verse 11, and Lord willing, we'll go through uh, 3, verse 7 uh, this morning. Uh, this is a really powerful passage. Titus only has, I think, 36, uh, maybe 37 verses. Or Let me see. Excuse me. It has 12, 15 and 15 and 16. So that's 46. That's what I meant to say. Okay. Math was not my strong suit. But I want to talk to you about the grace of God. And uh, I, want, I took my title today right out of the New American Standard Bible for 211, For the Grace of God has appeared. Uh, that's just such a powerful statement about what Christmas is all about. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Uh, first of all, I want to say, I don't know who did all these decorations, but they are absolutely great, aren't they? You know what, if you gave me the same stuff and turned me loose and said, Brother Wayne, you got two weeks, arrange the stuff any way you want to, just decorate the church, it would not look like this. You know why? I don't have the gift of decorating. <laughs> but I do have an eye for it once it's done. And whoever did this, you did a great, great job. Even the wreath in the back is the O oh, and joy. Did y'all notice that? Christ brings joy. Uh, when I look at this creche or this manger scene here, it reminds me of a younger time when my kids were, you know, I could... They could stand straight by my side. I could put my hand flat on top of their head. But what Terry and I did is we would um, get out our manger scene with all of its pieces, put them on the table, but again, not arranged, just laying on the table. And each parent would take one child, and each night we would do a devotional from the Bible and try to find a story related to one of the pieces in the manger scene. So we would literally take uh, the whole month of December to build our manger scene. And the last piece in place, of course, was the Christ child. And it was such a neat way to teach our kids and help them build anticipation and get the true meaning of Christmas. And, and then you could always say on Christmas Eve, before you put the Christ child in there, without the Christ child, the whole thing is meaningless, right? So uh, whoever did this is wonderful. I really like it. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a way to learn. Uh, many generations of Christians were illiterate. They could not read or write. And the church down through the ages has used statu statuaries, icons, stained glass windows to tell the biblical story. And uh, so this is a wonderful thing um, to just behold this. I was watching a series on Queen Elizabeth on PBS, and it started with her father, George VI, and he found out he had um, incurable lung cancer. And his last Christmas, the, uh, he was um, in one of his many uh, kingly estates, and the children of the village came and sang that old carol, What Shall I Bring Him? Poor such as I am, if I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb and so forth. So, uh, you ought to read the words to that old hymn, uh, Carol. It's really beautiful. Um, but Christmas is a time for us to focus on that statement. The grace of God has appeared. And for, so for the next few moments, I want us to think about what kind of grace that was. And the first thing I want you to notice that uh, Paul told Titus. Keep in mind who Titus is and who Paul is. Paul is toward the end of his ministry. He's passing the baton to the next generation of ministers. We've already talked about his relationship with Timothy. Well, Titus was one of Paul's important lieutenants. When Paul was in Ephesus and there was trouble in the church in Corinth, it was Titus that Paul said, you need to get over there, help them work through these problems. They even challenged Paul's uh, apostolic leadership. And it was Titus who came in and did a lot of the healing ministry. In other words, the hard stuff where you get, it's like being a ref in a, 
uh, between two fighters that hate each other and they both swing. Even when you tell them not to swing, they both swing and you stand in to break it up and you get hit from both sides, you know. That's the kind of person Titus was. Titus would stand in there to help the, uh, the ministry. And Paul took Titus with him to the fifth largest island in the Mediterranean, the island of Crete. And they established churches there. And Paul said, Titus, you stay here on Crete and make sure the Christian ministry takes a root and gets a good strong foothold here. And so Paul wrote this letter to Titus probably after his first Roman imprisonment ended. He was headed that way. He wanted Titus to come and meet him up on the western shore of Greece. And he gives those instructions to him. But he also wants to encourage Titus about the ministry there on that island of Crete. You need to teach people. You need to help them understand. You need to help those Cretan Christians uh, live for the Lord. And why should we live for the Lord? And what Paul's whole premise is in this whole letter to Titus is we not only can live for the Lord, we should live for the Lord because of His grace and what God has done for us. So um, someone said grace is not just what God does in saving us or what we do because the Lord saved us, but it's, it's, it's what God has already done for us. And anything we do is a response uh, to that. So the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Paul was a Hebrew, a, 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 so, so a Semite. And the way the Semitic people think, if you have a group, a mixed company like we do today, men and women in different ages, in their language, whether it was writing or speaking, they would default to the use of the masculine plural. So when we re bring that this grace of God has appeared uh, to all men, you would need to understand the way they would hear that. They would hear that as it has appeared to all people. And in the recent news, there's been a discussion about gender-inclusive translations of the Bible and getting rid of gender and different things like what the Pope is saying and things like that. Um, it's a difficult issue because you have to deal with two facets. One, you've got to deal with God. God is neither a man or a woman. He's neither male nor female. He's spirit. And Jesus said those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. But God revealed himself to a world of people where we do have gender, man and woman, male and female. And when he revealed himself in biblical days, the societies were patriarch, uh, patriarchal. So the language defaulted to the masculine use of pronouns and nouns and so forth. And so uh, God is referred to as a father, not a mother. He, not she, and so forth. Now what some people are doing in translations are come today and they say we need to have gender inclusive language and they're often changing what the Bible says. Well, look at Titus 2.11. If you were to say the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all people, there's no problem, right? Because we believe that. We, I don't think anyone would read Titus 2.11 and think that what Paul was telling Titus is God's salvation is only for men and only men. No, it's for women too. As Paul demonstrated everywhere he went in his ministry, he welcomed the uh, belief and the fellowship and the discipleship of women and their ministry. Jesus benefited from the uh, ministry of women in his own traveling company. If you read Luke 8, 1 through 3, or read where Jesus is being buried, the women are watching at a distance and they're the first that come to the tomb uh, for the uh, resurrection discovery. Uh, they were going to anoint uh, a corpse and they found out there was no corpse to anoint. So the grace of God that brings salvation, first of all, is a saving grace. And it's the grace of God. So the of God tells us the source of this salvation. That's why I can confidently stand before you today and say there's not a single one of you in this church today. Not a single one of you who is so bad that God can't save you. Where your sin abound, God's grace does much more abound. And I'll tell you something else. God knows how sinful you are before He sends His grace to appear to you. He knows how bad you are. He's not being surprised by our wickedness. 
His grace is a saving grace and its very source is God Himself. And then it's the saving grace is uh, not only sourced in God, but it's manifested. The grace of God has appeared. It's been seen. It has appeared uh, to people. It's salvific. It brings salvation. Um, if you want to argue over things, and commentators do this all the time, but bringing salvation to all men is the way the New American Standard uh, words it to all men. Uh, someone says bringing the offer of salvation to all people. We know not all people are saved. How do we know that? Not only does the Bible tell us, but even in your own sharing of your faith with other people, you've had people say no to you. I'm not into all that religion stuff, or they'll write it off any number of ways. Uh, one time I went to witness to a man. He lived in a mobile home. It was about, a, I don't know, 50 yards in the middle of his property surrounded by a fence with a latched gate. And I went to his house and I unlatched the gate and closed it and latched it behind me. And I was about halfway, I guess 25, 30 yards towards his house. I've got about 20 more yards to go. And out of nowhere, these three German shepherds come running from behind his house, barking, baring their fangs. There was one thing I was very sure of. I was not going to outrun three dogs with four-wheel drive 30 yards back to that gate. So you know, the only thing I had to do, if you can't use your legs, use your head, right? I, I wondered what would I do, and I wondered fast though, by the way, uh, what would I do if I, this was my house, and my German Shepherd, and I've owned two now, if my German Shepherd ran out barking and baring his fangs, I acted just like I was supposed to be there. And I yelled at those dogs. I said, what are you doing? Get out of here. Get back under that house. Those dogs stopped in their tracks. They looked at me, and they turned around and went right back <laughs> under the house. I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Pulled out my handkerchief. <laughs> It went like that. I went and knocked on the door and had an opportunity to share uh, Christ with the family. You know what the first question the guy asked? How did you get by my dogs? And I said, well, the Lord I'm telling you about is Lord even of your dogs. <laughs> uh, he took care of those for me. Um, and we ended up developing quite a good relationship. His name was Billy, and he came to know uh, the Lord. But the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all people, and it's a salvific, uh, saving grace. It brings us in harmony and in reconciliation with God. It's all-inclusive. When it says all men, I've mentioned about the gender issue. It, it means all men, all women, all ages. Um, but it doesn't mean all people will be saved. The doctrine that some people hold to, it's not biblical, but some people still believe it. Um, the doctrine of universalism is the idea that in the end everybody will be saved. Now that's not a doctrine from the Bible, that's a doctrine from secular humanism that probably doesn't even believe in God, certainly doesn't let the Bible interfere with their theology. But the idea that everyone will be saved, it takes the language of it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Or you'll hear people say it doesn't matter what God you serve, as long as you are faithful uh, to the very end, then you'll be saved. Or there's only uh, one God, but we call that God by different names. And the problem with that is, if you read the special holy books of different people who worship different gods, you're going to find out that the description of the one true creator God who redeems in the Bible doesn't match the description of the Muslim God, of Buddhism, of uh, Confucianism, or any other uh, teaching system in this world that either has a God or a, a, some kind of uh, philosophy of life or worldview put in place of God. So with the scripture, I'm really convinced you either go all the way in with the God of the Bible, uh, Jesus Christ, or you're completely out. If you're left out, you're leaving yourself out because the grace of God 
that brings salvation has been manifested or made known or has appeared to all people. And scholars, again, will say, does this mean all people meaning every person or is it all people meaning every type of person? And my answer to those two questions is yes. There's no type of person God excludes from the possibility of repentance and faith. I've often said if Wayne Van Horn goes to hell, I won't be in hell because God didn't have salvation for me. I will go to hell because he did have salvation for me, but I said no. I don't believe that. I don't want that. I'm not changing my life. I'm not giving this or that up. And I would be in hell because I did not take God at his word. But I can read in the scripture where it says there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we can be saved, the name Christ Jesus. I can read where Paul says there's one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. And I can read that when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. So this is a saving grace. And then secondly, it's an instructing grace. God's grace teaches us. And if you look at verse, uh, I'm still in Titus chapter 2, but look at uh, 12 through 15 here, the instructing. In fact, in the New American Standard, the first word is instructing in verse 12. So this grace that has appeared to all, bringing salvation, it instructs us to do what? To deny some things and to live a certain way and to look. Deny, live, and look. Y'all see that? Instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. Now, I've often heard Christianity should not be confused with just a list of do's and don'ts. I totally agree with that. It's a relationship. But when I married my wife, I entered into a special relationship with her. And the relationship is based on trust, dependability, commitment, faithfulness. And so because of all those things, there are going to be some things that I don't do. And because of the very same things, there are going to be some things I will always do. I always love my wife, always pray for her, always provide for her, protect her. If it's in my power to do something good for Terry, I'm going to do that. I take that as my God-given job assignment as a husband. With other women, I can be friends. I can be friendly. I can be a co-worker. But another woman can never take the place of Terry in my wife, in my life. My, she's my wife, and no one can take her place. This is an instructing grace. So if you're a Christian, how do you know you're saved? Well, Paul is telling us right here that that saving grace is also an instructing grace, and it instructs us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, whatever they may be. But then on the positive side, we are to live sensibly. The word means soberly, staying away from being in a drunken stupor, if you will. We're to live righteously, conforming our lives to God's way and word. We're to live godly, a life pleasing to God himself. I see God on his throne looking down, watching you, and he sees you do something, and he says, wow, that's my daughter. That's my son uh, doing that. Uh, when Satan came before in the council of God, Job chapters 1 and 2, um, God said, have you considered my servant Job? He's blameless, upright, fears God, turns aside from evil. And even though Satan tried to destroy Job's testimony, in the end he was unsuccessful, God was so proud of his servant Job. that teaches us to live soberly, righteously, Godly. It teaches us to look, look at verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. What did Jesus do? He gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. That's how, another way you can know you're saved. You want to do the good works of God. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. He had already told his younger apprentice, 
Timothy, let no man despise your youth. And now he tells Titus, who's a bit older, he says, let no one disregard you. So we have a saving grace. We have an instructing grace. And by the way, on this instructing grace, let me say one other thing. On verse 12, it says we to live soberly, righteously, godly in the present age. Um, I love that for a couple of reasons. First of all, the Greek word for present is noon. It means now, the now age. Um, when I read that word now, I like to apply this to now. This is December 2nd, 2018. If you're a Christian, I want to ask you, what are you waiting for? Now is the time to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Now is the time to live soberly, righteously, godly. Uh, right now, this is the time. Here's the time to make our move. This is the time to make the world know that we are in Christ and we're proud of that and we love the Lord and He's done so much for us. 14, He gave Himself for us. He redeemed us from every lawless deed. He purified us and made us His own possession. And all He wants is a people zealous for good deeds. So Paul tells Titus, speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Make sure they get this word. And then thirdly, this grace is not only a saving grace and an instructing grace, but I want you to see this. It's a considerate grace. And I want to, you to look at 3, 1 through 3 with me. But Paul's talking to Titus about the Christians on Crete. He says, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all people. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. This is a considerate grace. First of all, considerate of rulers, people in authority. Who's in authority over you? If you think about it, every life, every one of us in this church live under authority. Live under authority. And the Christian way is to be subject to those in authority over us. I'll never forget when Dr. Royce, our uh, most recent uh, past president of Mississippi College, offered me a job there. Um, I called him and I said, Dr. Royce, I don't have a piece about this. Can I come talk to you again, second time? And in his office on a Friday, it was the last Friday of April 2005, that's when I told him the way I think if I come to teach at Mississippi College, I'll be under your authority and I need to advance your vision for the university and your vision for the Christian Studies Department. But I said, I don't know what that vision is. Can you tell me? And boy, could he tell me. Very articulate. He started off 10 minutes. Uh, he, he laid it out there. Very good. But it was only when I was listening and putting myself under his authority that I could hear God's voice speaking. And I mean, three minutes into Dr. Royce talking, I heard that still small voice in here where just as clearly as you're hearing my voice now, it's the Lord saying, I want you to come work for this man. But it took me putting myself under his authority. And I, I told him when I accepted the job, I said, I will always try to do what you expect of me to do. And the only, you know where I draw the line, if any leader or anyone in authority over me, the only time I won't do what they want me to do is if it's contrary to God's word. I won't disobey God so I can uh, honor the authority of a person, okay? Always put God first. Dr. Royce never put me in the position, by the way, of picking because he was a very godly leader. When our new president came, uh, he made it a point to come around to all the dean's offices and talk to us personally. And uh, I handed him a letter. And that letter welcomed him to Mississippi College. And I pledged him my support. But what, the reason I'm telling you all is it's not I'm such a hero and I get it right. Man, I've gotten things wrong so many times in my life. When I preach, I'm letting you overhear my own 
struggle in my own Christian interaction with this world. Your person in authority may be the boss at a retail store if you work there, or it may be a principal at a school, or it may be a headmaster at an academy. It may be um, the owner of a dealer, auto dealership, or maybe wherever you work, there's someone in authority over you. I pray for our president. I don't hold Donald Trump up as a paradigm of virtue. I don't think he is. But I do know he's president of the United States, and I pray for him. I probably disagreed on policy more with Barack Obama than any president we've ever had. But I prayed for him because I'm under his authority from uh, the year uh, 2009, January 20, 2009, until the same date in 2017. You pray for these folks and you never let the way you speak or act about them detract from Christianity. You want to put your best witness forward each and every time. So this considerate grace is a grace that considers the authority of those who are above us. Secondly, it considers others. If you look at 3.2, Paul wants Titus to remind the Cretan Christians to malign no one. Be peaceable. Be gentle. Show every consideration for all people. Why? Because it also considers our past. We also were once, look at all these things, we were foolish ourselves, we were disobedient, we were deceived, we were enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, we were spending our life in malice and envy, we were hateful and we were hating uh, one another. We were really bad back in the day, Paul says. And now because you see someone who is really bad, don't you get down on them or be judgmental or holier than thou or think you need to put them in their place. Instead, you need to realize, but by the grace of God, that's me. The only difference between them and me is God's grace. And if God could save me, as Paul said in 1 Timothy 1.15, he could save anybody. So we look at people and we say there's two kinds of people in the world. There are those who are saved and living for Christ. And there are those who need to be saved and start living for Christ. And we want to live in such a way as to win them. And I want to give you one last thing about this grace today. Besides being saving and instructing and considerate, this is a grateful grace. If you look at 4 through 7, having just described us as being bad folks in the old days, he said, but when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration, renewing by the Holy Spirit. Uh, God has done a great work in us. I learned this from a different translation. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy hath He saved us us. And when we can grasp that, the only reason Wayne Van Horn can stand up here today is by the grace of God. God forgave my sins. He restored me. He renewed me. He called me. And he does the same for everyone who will take him at his word. Talking about the Holy Spirit, he poured out his spirit upon us richly, lavishly, through Jesus Christ our Savior. So talking about God the Father, talking about the Holy Spirit, talking about Jesus Christ the Son. All the Trinity is engaged in our salvation. So that being justified by His grace, verse 7, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I was thinking about this grace, and I want to compare today what this Christmas scene in front of me, what the message of Christmas, the music we sing, what does it mean? Where there is sin, Jesus offers forgiveness. Where there is judgment, He offers acquittal. Where there is darkness, He offers light. Where there is hate, He brings love. Where there is despair, He brings hope. Where there is depression, He brings joy. Where there is sorrow, He brings comfort. 
Where there is aimlessness, he gives guidance. Where there's destruction, he brings restoration. Where there's chaos, he offers order. Where there's loneliness, he brings friendship. Where there's rejection, he brings acceptance. Where there's lawlessness, he brings the law of Christ. Where there's putref uh, putrefaction, he brings purification. Where there's evil, he brings good. And where there's a great debt, he brings a salvation that is paid for by his son. And it costs you not one penny. Only to believe and receive. Would you stand as we pray? Father God, we love you so very much. We pray that love will be shown in the way we live. Lord, we're surrounded by people who need Jesus Christ. Lord, they, they need to hear the gospel of Christ, and they need to know you. Lord, help us to be humble. Help us to lead quiet lives, work with our hands, and mind our own business. But Lord, when people ask us of the hope that is within us, may we be ready to give an account to them. May we not look down on other people as being inferior to or more sinful than we are. Lord, help us to remember that we were once just like they are now, but your grace entered our lives through faith and your grace changed us. Lord, thank you for the Christmas message that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all people. And Lord, it's our prayer today that all people will turn in repentance and faith to Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Brother Ken.